one here. I'm just in my way. Okay. I'll now call to order the September 27th regular meeting of the Wellington Board of Trustees, the time being 6.30 p.m. Um, first, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Initially, we had scheduled the water and sewer rate discussion for this evening. The rate discussion has been moved to a special Board of Trustees work session for October 4th at 6.30 p.m. After tonight's regular meeting, we will transition to a work session discussing water and sewer fund capital improvement projects. On behalf of myself, the Board of Trustees, and the town staff, we sincerely apologize for any inconvenience this may have caused. We look forward to having the rate conversation with the most accurate data available next week. The Board of Trustees meetings are recorded and available on the Town of Wellington YouTube channel. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May I get a roll call, please? Trustee Gator. Here. Trustee Daly. Trustee Mason. Here. Trustee Teets. Here. Trustee Wiegand. Mayor Pro Tem McDonald. Here. Mayor Shosey. Are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? Are there any conflicts of interest related to items on the agenda this evening? Okay, we will move to item B1, public comment. Individuals wishing to speak on non-agenda items are asked to sign up on the form provided at the podium. When at the podium, please state your name for the record and you will be limited to three minutes during public comment. Okay. Moving on, Larimer County Sheriff's Office is here to present their 2023 uh, budget. We have Lieutenant, excuse me, Bedberg and Sergeant Cherry will be here. One second here, she can get signed in. I'll give you three. Three, okay, <laughs> appreciate that. Trustee Daly has joined the meeting. It is 6.33 p.m. And Trustee Wiegand is joining the meeting as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Amen. Mm. Uh, three minutes counts uh, for technical issues, or can I have an extension on the three minutes? You can. Okay, extension that. granted. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be interesting too. We probably have you for an hour. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I didn't make a cheeky comment. Like, for every 10 seconds, we should reduce the sheriff's contract. Uh, you know, because <laughs> we would wow. we would be in trouble right now. <laughs> Came up right after you said that. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, um, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Board of Trustees, Town Staff. Um, I'm Lamar County, um, Sergeant Sherry with the Lamar County Sheriff's Office. 
We're here to talk to you about uh, the budget proposal for 2023 between the sheriff's office and the town. Uh, obviously, I have some backup uh, behind me, uh, Lieutenant Troy Badberg. He's going to be uh, helping me out, just talking about some of the things that um, that we want to propose. But more, most importantly, is as Under Sheriff Tim Keaton, he is here to kind of break down some of the numbers of uh, of the budget. So I, I think you'll have, if you have any very specific questions about that, I think. He's probably the most um, uh, important one to answer some of those. Okay. Let's see if I can kind of get this out of your way a little bit. I'm sure Keaton. Just going over some of the and and I'll introduce myself again. Tim Keaton. I'm the under sheriff for Larimer County. Going over some of the budget numbers, uh, I was told that there were some questions regarding the vehicle purchase. I believe. And then how Larimer County does their vehicle purchase up front, and then the rates that go into how we operate with with the replacement plan for our cars for all of our vehicles. I can just go into that in a general sense, and then get as granular as you would like if you want. If that's kind of agreeable, is that what you're looking for? So you see on here the cost of roughly sixty thousand, so that we know right where we're looking at. So I think it's fifty nine nine thirty. That's $59,930. That's the initial cost to purchase the vehicle and then upfit it to operate as a police package vehicle. That's a lot of different things uh, and equipment that's put into it to operate with, the, I believe the exception in that price point is the radio. That comes from a different source, but that is included in here in radio equipment. And then there becomes a lease payment on that given vehicle each year annually. And here's what that goes into roughly half, but it's probably somewhere between half and two thirds goes to a replacement plan. It's around 550 ish dollars, depending on the vehicle platform. I'll jump into that a little bit later. Then the rest of that is probably in the 400 some dollar range. This is around eight, I've done the math. It's $897 or something like that monthly. The rest of that is tires, oil changes, any damage to, to, to fix it uh, throughout its lifespan. And that's the, a three-year running average. That's also fuel for each vehicle. So that's a three-year running average that we average and go into maintenance of the vehicle. But let's talk a little bit more about the replacement plan. Is, let me ask this. Anybody in here in aviation? Okay, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll start at more of a ground level then. If, if you buy an airplane or if you go purchase or, or uh, go rent an airplane, they know exactly when that engine is going to be re uh, overhauled and they know exactly how much it costs or pretty darn close to how much it costs to overhaul that engine. So all they do is if, if you have a, you need an overhaul on, a, on an aircraft engine at 1500 hours, they're going to take the cost of that overhaul divided by 1500 and every time you rent a plane, or if you go purchase a plane, the owners of that in, in, a, in a mutual agreement will put away that many hours per hour of use of that aircraft. So that when you get to needing a half a million dollar engine, you're not looking around for half a million dollars. Same concept here. We roughly know what the cost of that car is going to be. And we, uh, I'm, I'm looking into finding the actual answer to this. I hope we're not using the $60,000 number because... Six years from now, I can't replace these cars at $60,000. I'm learning, as we all know, inflation is real. But we, we project the replacement cost. We divide it by the 60 months or the 72 months, whichever platform of vehicle we're talking about. Some of our vehicles we keep in play for 12 to 15 years, depending on the specialty nature of that. But we put away money in a replacement plan monthly so that when we get to the end of the service life of the vehicle, we're not looking for another huge pot of money. It's already there. So that's the concept of the monthly payments in for, for the replacement plan for all of our vehicles. Open that up for any questions. So I guess the main question, thank you for explaining that. That Absolutely. does help a lot. Like the lease portion, that made sense. So, but the question I have is, so right, we're in there, the 59, 930, that's the cost. Correct. Who owns that vehicle? Does the town of Wellington own that vehicle because we're paying the entire cost or is that vehicle owned by Larimer County Sheriff's Office? That's a great question. 
And the answer is neither. The Larimer County fleet actually owns the vehicle. So in talking about that for, let's say you guys terminated a contract with Larimer County Sheriff's Office next year. I think you have a very viable argument to go to Larimer County fleet and say, I paid full purchase price for this car and I only got to use it for one year. Let's talk about a pro rated opportunity for me to purchase that car back. Do I think that's realistic? Sure. Do I know if there's a precedent that has been set where that's happened before? I don't know. You've had, do you have any knowledge of that ever happening I, in the I past? Never, I sit on the, the consumer advisory board that oversees our fleet management system as well. And we haven't had anything like that come up, but kind of the discussions there, what that would look like, either getting that car back at that prorated value or refunding the money at a prorated value based on the wear and tear on the vehicle and how long it's been in service, I think would be a, a genuine argument to get that back. But as the undersheriff said, it's, we don't even own the vehicle. They're, mm -hmm. they're owned by our, by our fleet services. And when, when you mentioned it as a lease payment, it really is. It's, we are leasing it from Larimer County fleet. Yeah, so I understand that, but typically, like, if, if I'm going to lease a truck from Chevy, I don't pay Chevy 60 grand and then lease the vehicle from them. <laughs> Very true. 12 years, so it's kind of like on one yeah. side, it's like we're paying full cost up front for the vehicle yeah. that we don't own, and then we're, I understand, like, paying for the vehicle, like, all that makes sense, but it's like, well, we're paying for that and we're paying full price for the vehicle, so yeah. it's... It, it's not exactly weird... leasing, you're absolutely right sure. there. Really, what we're paying fleet for is to ad administer the administration of acquisition of all the vehicles, which, okay. are, which are thousand. Sure. I don't know. Have any idea? But for sure. all road and bridge and everything, acquisition of all those, and then a centralized location for all services, oil changes, repairs, overhauls, you know, you lose a transmission and you have to have a technician put a new transmission in it. All of that happens at fleet, at okay. Larimer County Fleet Services. Got it. Any other questions? So are these all shared costs when you look at Larimer County as a whole? Or is this just a cost for Wellington services here in Wellington? Because while we station here with LCSO, we also, you guys do get called out to other areas in Larimer County. Say, so Estes Park, if they contract five officers with you guys, do they also cover their own costs of those contracted officers? Or is it, that's my question is, is this a pool that's shared? in all of these costs or is Wellington assigned their own for whatever we're assigned here as far as deputies, sergeants? Sure, and great such? question. Um, a couple of different things. This contract is specifically for Wellington, meaning that these, these people, while we, I would never tell them, you can't leave the city limits of Wellington for an emergency call that's two miles down the road. They are specifically assigned to the town of Wellington as a police department, if you will. We have three unique contracts of that nature with Wellington, Berthoud, and Timnath. Timnath is a little unique in the fact that we don't provide 100% of their police services, but there is a financial contractual agreement between each of the three entities. You're absolutely right. And for instance, let's just say the equipment replacement costs here are 4,400. What I do there is I add up the entire amount that I pay on equipment in a given year, and I divide that by 352, because that is the number of sworn law enforcement officers we have in Larimer County. But that includes all officers working the street, both in contract towns and in unincorporated, and every single sworn member at the jail. Because for, for a lot of these services, let's say the insurance costs, those are the one. Th those are the members, really, that we are insuring. So I divide it by everything. Got it. Mm -hmm. That's a co-op. So to say, we are also putting it into a pool. We're assigned to Wellington. Our officers are. Mm -hmm. But is it safe to say that we're not carrying all of this burden? That this is being divided up among all of your LCSOs? You are. Period? That's a great. Yeah, you're absolutely only carrying the burden of the cost for six deputies, one corporal, one sergeant. Perfect. That's it. Got it. 
Got it. Yep, that's a, yeah. that's fair. I wish it was that low. <laughs> My insurance costs are have have seven figures with them. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions up here? Does Trustee Kinney have any comment online? Trying to get her promoted to panelist. Oh, okay. No, she does not. Okay, great. Thank you so much for Thank your time you. this evening. Okay, so uh, I know that uh, the under sheriff kind of talked about this. Trustee Gator had presented some questions beforehand. Uh, was that answered your satisfaction, sir? Uh, yes, it was. It We'll have board discussion at some point, I guess. But yes, that answered my questions. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, one of the additional questions that Trustee Gator had uh, presented was uh, talking about the the addition or the request for another corporal um, and potentially another deputy and kind of what those duties would um, duties were and what it would cost. So this is kind of where we start talking about our second corporal. I I need to give you some perspective on just kind of what our schedule looks like. This is our red blue schedule. So we have what's called a red platoon and our blue platoon. So right now, um, blue platoon is on. And so that means red platoon is off. So if it's a blue day, um, then red side, uh, red platoon is off and vice versa. Does that make sense? Um, so we have three deputies for each side, uh, blue side and red side. So I start plugging in some additional uh, colors that starts getting kind of confusing. Um, but right now we have, um, so we have our three deputies uh, on each side, blue side and red side. This is for the month of October. Uh, and the green days represent the days that Corporal Downing, our, our, our only corporal, would be working. So um, that first week, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, um, he'd be off the seventh through the 11th, and he'd be back on the 12th through the 16th. He'd be off for those days. Uh, and obviously, you start seeing uh, a BT and RT, those are training days. Uh, between the, the red platoon and the blue platoon. Um, so this is just, this just indicates the coverage. I'm working on Monday through Thursday, um, 6.45 to 5 p.m. in the, uh, 6.45 in the morning to 5 p.m. So you, you can see, if you just kind of look at that calendar, that there are plenty of days where we just don't have any supervisor coverage. Um, and that's not ideal. We tried over this uh, earlier earlier this year, tried splitting that up so that Corporal Downing was working on what would be the green side, those green days, and I would work on what's called the white schedule. Uh, so we were opposite of each other. So we tried to divvy up the, the responsibilities for supervisors. Unfortunately, I never saw my corporal um, and I can't give him any of the training that he needs to make him a better supervisor. That's, that's a problem. So he and I need to be a team and be able to work together sometimes. This is kind of where we're at right now. Um, obviously the one stars and I told you 6.45 to 5 p.m. Our corporal works that green white schedule that I described. He typically works about 2 p.m. to 12.15 in the morning. So there's, there's some overlap there. Six deputies uh, alternating, I, I showed you between red and blue and those are the shifts. So we have a day shift at 6.45 in the morning to 5 p.m. A power shift deputy comes on about 2 p.m. gets off about 12.15, swing shift 4 p.m. to 2.30 in the morning. And you notice that there's no graveyard shift. There's no midnight shift to speak of. So between 2.30 in the morning and 6.45 in the morning, there are no deputies that are assigned to Wellington working and covering the street. Those responsibilities are picked up by the deputies that are working in, I, I call the valley, but it's any deputies are, that are not assigned to Wellington. So if there's a, if there's a call at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, um, we have to wait for a deputy that is coming from the Valley, maybe Fort Collins, um, some of those areas to respond here. Um, and that's the way it's been, at least since I've worked for the sheriff's office, we just haven't had that coverage. So what are we looking at? So this is kind of a, a crude calendar. Uh, this is a 24 hour calendar, just kind of shows that blue, that blue indicates, you know, the day shift between 645 to five, you have that power shift coming on. So some, some overlap between, um, two and, and midnight, and then you have that swing shift um, that's a little after four to 2.30 in the morning, but nothing after 2.30 in the morning. What we're kind of looking at doing for this next year, um, again, something that's never been done in Wellington before is, is adding that midnight shift, graveyard shift, so we have 24-hour coverage. 
Um, but we have to eliminate the power shift to be able to do that. Typically the evening is some of our busier times. Uh, so moving that power shift to a midnight shift. So that would basically be 9 p.m. at night to 7.15 in the morning. So we have some overlap. This is kind of what it would look like. So you have your day shift, uh, your swing shift, and that yellow indicates that, that midnight shift. So you do have some overlap there. And we're not even talking about a corporal right now. We add a corporal, which it, uh, is uh, indicated by the green. You, you'll see there's even more overlap. That corporal basically would come on about, we say about noon, get off about um, 10 in the evening. So it, during our busiest hours, which is typically in the evening, we would have at least two, if not three people working on any day. Um, that's if we were at a, to add a second corporal. Without that second corporal, we're back to that original calendar where there's gonna be some days where we have this type of coverage, some days where we don't have this kind of, that type of coverage. Uh, we start talking about some of the pros of adding a second corporal, um, improved supervisor coverage. So this is every day versus some sort of sta staggered schedule between myself and my corporal. We always have somebody in a supervisory role working every single day, even Monday through Thursday, you would have at least two supervisors working. Better command and control. I don't have to rely on, on supervisors from the Valley outside of Wellington that are coming up and trying to, to fill in that role. It's very difficult for them. And actually they were pretty excited about just the, the mid, midnight deputy um, um, proposal, but adding a second corporal would be huge, just trying to maintain um, that supervisor uh, balanced. Uh, reduce liability. Obviously, if we have a supervisor on, somebody that has a lot more training experience, we would we drastically reduce the liability because they can step in in some of those those uh, higher liability situations. Um, anytime that a deputy calls in sick, has training, uh, that they're going to be outside of the town, either myself or Corporal Downing have to step in to be able to fill those shifts. So if Deputy Schultz, who works blue days, he he takes he needs some time off. I either need to pull one of the deputies from um, the power shift or myself or the corporal have to step in with the second corporal on both days or on, on both sides of the week, red and blue. I'd have a red red platoon corporal and a blue platoon corporal. We'd always be able to, to handle that uh, more efficiently. Um, the corporal is always the lead trainer. They're the field training officers of, of the agency. They do most of the training. So it's obvious that if I added a second corporal, I had a corporal on every shift, our corporals could be doing additional training with the deputies. So uh, improved training. Uh, we talked about the consistent shift coverage. It's not a hit or miss of when we're gonna actually have uh, three, but that corporal would be acting in, a, uh, in that power shift type role. So in the evening before the midnight shift deputy comes on, we always have two people on. Um, Graders, I had to add this, greater assistance to the sergeants, okay? Um, this, this greatly helps me out um, just in just some of the, the street management, whereas it allows me better flexibility of um, interacting with you, interacting with the town staff to, to help solve problems. Obviously, the, the con is increased cost, okay? It's a lot more expensive to, to, add, to add the corporal. This is what you just saw. Um, and I just kind of highlighted what that additional corporal position would, would be. Um, it's an additional $263,000 um, on top of, of uh, the current corporal. Uh, I have a quick question for you relative to the, the salary piece. When was the last time Larimer County did a salary study? You want to start that? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. We have studied, uh, they do it every year at the upper county level for all uh, employees of the county. We did a fairly significant increase last year. Each sworn member got about a 23 to 24% raise last year because the gap was getting so large between a Larimer County deputy and the vast majority of agencies locally that we compete with for talent. So they had a significant raise. Our spread right now between, and, and I'll be honest with you, I measure my competition is Fort Collins Police Department because they, while they are the highest paid in the in the area, 
my challenge has become there's been four or five other agencies who have recognized that and said, if we want to compete, mm -hmm. we're just going to pay that. And they just pay it. So my spread right now is about 4.8% between a starting salary of a Larimer County deputy and a brand new starting police officer with Fort Collins Police Department. That being said, it is going to broaden to roughly 7% in 2023 ish. May I ask Between you another question? Relative that, to that. Can I ask again. you another question relative course, to that? Please do. But earlier you mentioned that there are currently 352 sheriffs employed by Larimer County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff's sworn deputies. Sworn deputies. So we've got Thank about you. 550 employees, about 352 sworn deputies. But the vast majority of those sworn deputies work in the jail. We have about a hundred, but I, I'd have to look specifically, but between about 101 and 105 sworn deputies working the street. So my next question to that is, is how many vacancies do you have for sworn deputies at this time? For sworn deputies on the street or in the jail? Do you want On me the to, street. On the street, probably one, two, two, two. Thank you. So we're pretty, we're pretty well staffed. That says a lot. That says that you guys are being very competitive in your salaries, wages, and benefits relative to surrounding agencies. We are. It's uh, We are drawing, and, and ironically, we're drawing people from literally all over the country. We're hiring from New York, New Jersey, Florida, Georgia, e everywhere. They're coming from to us for the reputation that Larimer County brings as a very professional department that works well with its community. It is, there's a lot of agencies in around this country who'd like to have our problems. Make no mistake. And I'm very proud of that. And it's not because of me. I, I put most of the credit right back here. Who's sitting back here being silent. Thank you. Um, on any other questions about the the second corp patrol corporal and what that right so um, a few months ago when we started talking about the, the the school resource officer trying to add a second school resource officer um, obviously that didn't happen we had some discussions Tr trustee gator and i had a conversation um, just about adding the potential for adding another deputy whose sole responsibility would be just kind of being available when school is is open um, and just to be able to respond if other deputies were not able to do so. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they would look like. We had to kind of fall back on this concept that the town of Bertha just implemented with this community impact deputy. Uh, uh, I believe uh, um, Patty Garcia had sent you the information. Um, I hope that the board was able to see that yeah. the email. Okay. Um, I'm just, these are just kind of snippets out of what you were sent. Um, and this was just created to address the quality of life issues. So this could be a, essentially being a problem solver in the community. Um, this deputy would not be really restricted to set days of the week. Um, they could be moved around wherever there are major issues, um, wherever they could be the most um, beneficial. Again, these are just kind of snippets. You've, you have everything that uh, we've sent out, but I just wanted to highlight some of these things, just the community impact, being able to really interact with a lot of our, our community members, businesses, uh, organizations, and our citizens. This person would be very visible at a lot of the outdoor functions. So if we had you know the parades, festivals, those types of things, this person would be forefront to, to be able to interact with citizens uh, at all times. Um, if there's any issues in town, you know, we've seen graffiti popping up here and there, um, working with, with our SRO for any bullying, um, anything along those lines, uh, and certainly traffic enforcement. And we, we get into specialization. So this person's going to be a jack of all trades. Uh, they're going to be the expert in doing traffic accident investigations, DUIs, um, setting up the neighborhood, neighborhood watch programs. They're going to be really tied into our crime prevention unit to be able to, to get out and interact with um, the community. Uh, community relations, really just building a bridge between law enforcement and our citizens in town. This is this person's really gonna be out there uh, much more than I can, much more than my deputies can. This is hugely problematic for the deputies that are in town. We're trying to respond to calls, doing trying to do thorough investigations. Um, trying to get out and and uh, go to the boys and girls club which we love to do but sometimes it's it, we just don't have the time to do that this person would have those responsibilities of really uh, being available 
Um, now we start getting into cost. The cost, the cost of adding this person um, would be about the same as a, a regular patrol deputy. Obviously, there's some additional costs for equipment, um, but the cost would be same, same uh, as uh, one of our deputies that are working here in town. And I think that I had uh, another, obviously, the increased cost. Any questions related to that? And I think that's a pretty big position that just has a lot of different responsibilities. Um, and I'm not exactly sure if this is something that that's what you were kind of talking about. It's just this person that's that's more available that can respond in those types of situations. Any questions about that position? I do have a question about that. Sure. Is this person, do they carry a sidearm just like LCSO does? Yep. That was my only question. Yep, they would. They would have the same training equipment um, that any patrol deputy would have. And they can be assigned anywhere. In town. Depending on whatever is coming up, we have future events or whatever the problem is that they need to, to try to tackle, then we can move them around. So the deputy that would um, volunteer for this position would have to know they have to have a lot of flexibility in their schedule to, to, to bounce around a lot. Anything to add about that, Lieutenant? Okay. Anything else regarding that? Trustee Williams. Uh, Trustee Daly. Thank you for this presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time this evening. We appreciate your services to the community. Thank you so much. Here, Pratem, I just had a question. Um, did we want to reserve board discussion around these items and what we should or shouldn't do for a later time, or do we want to have that discussion today? Just. I think we should wait until other people can be present, including Mayor Chosey. Okay, awesome. So if we could just make sure to somewhere fit that into the calendar um, in our upcoming meetings. So I do have, I think we should discuss, you know, obviously I think it's great ideas, but we have to talk about what we can and can't afford. Um, so. Sure, and it'll be included with the budget presentation, um, which will identify the revenues and things like okay. that. So awesome. we it's in, intentionally included with that piece. So you can have a discussion at that time if that is appropriate. And. I'm sorry, one additional question. If you can answer it, that's great. If not, then an email is totally sufficient. When is the contract renewal for LCSO? We generally do it before the first of each year. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, it's in conjunction with the budget adoption. Perfect. Is that good? Excellent. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the answers to the questions. That helped a lot. Okay, moving on to action items. This evening, we have a public hearing for a rezone request from L1 Light Industrial to C2 Downtown Agenda. Oh, sorry. Backing up, the consent agenda consists of the minutes of the September 13th, 2022 Board of Trustees meeting. Can I get a motion to approve or any concerns? I had one note um, when we were talking, Patty, you can clarify this for me. We were discussing the HOA um, agenda item and I think Rebecca date sorry trustee Daly had said that she wanted to add the fourth option which was the special district did we decide against that or are we also classifying or considering that as well because it, it's not listed in the minutes so I just wanted to make sure that we were taking that into consideration before we approve them since it was trustee Daly's comment would she like to Trustee Daly, you should be promoted. Hello, and I was switching to. Um, You're muted. Can you guys hear me now? Uh, they can hear her online. It's the output microphone. 
करेंगे Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. there you are. Yay. Okay. I probably should have continued trying talking. Otherwise, I was <laughs> just sitting here silently, <laughs> hoping that it was working all of a sudden. I didn't hear the question because I was um, being switched to panelists. What was the question? It was regarding the special district allowances. Would you please repeat your question for Trustee Daly? Yes. So during the Harvest Village HOA, the non-potable irrigation system request, there mm -hmm. was four total items that I had noted. And one was um, a request of you, Trustee Daly, that we also consider the option four for the special district possibility. Just it's not noted here in the minutes. And I want to make sure that it is noted if that is something that you had felt strongly about. I had recommended it since it is a decision of the residents um, and could be a very good financing technique for them without having to affect their affordability significantly in the short time. So uh, I remember raising that recommendation. I don't remember, um, unfortunately, what the whether or not the entire board was behind that decision. But in my mind, I'd like to give them as many opportunities so they can work through that with staff. I don't, I don't, uh, I remember it wasn't, nobody was strongly against it. I don't know if we decided that was uh, okay. an option. Okay. Since this is on a consent calendar, I might recommend that we'll take another look at the, recording. through that recording from that meeting and we can, we can bring this back at another time. Perfect. So if would that, you like for us to table that until the next regular board meeting? Okay. With the. I make a motion to table our consent agenda minutes from this. You don't need to do that. Oh, I don't need to. Oh, right. Yeah, and I, if you see something in the minutes that doesn't quite make sense or you have a question about, feel free to reach out to me. We are, like like you all know, we are trying really hard to, to take care of a lot of different duties. And I did have a resident reach out to me with a question on the minutes when we posted the packet, which I was so grateful for. So made some changes based on, made some corrections based on that. So you as trustees, if you see something in the minutes that you believe needs to be looked at, please reach out to me. I'd love to get that taken care of before our meeting starts. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. It would be my hope and understanding that since you're filling those dual roles that we have a lot of grace in, you know, maybe the minutes may not make it to the next meeting sometimes. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Okay, now this is a public hearing rezone request from L1 Light Industrial to C2 Downtown Core Commercial District on Lot 1 and North 15 feet of Lot 2, Block 9, Wellington Plan for Subdivision, Mr. Bird. Well said, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you for uh, your introduction. Cody before we get started, I apologize for interrupting, but based on the fact that I am via Zoom and we have public hearing items approaching, I do need to recuse myself for the two action items. Thank you for the clarification, Trustee Daly. Sure. Thank you, Cody Bird, Planning Director. Um, well said on the introduction, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just wanna kind of point out too, and as Trustee Daly alluded to, there are two items associated with this particular request. Um, we separate the public hearing portion from the action item, which is adoption of an ordinance um, or consideration of an ordinance. Um, so there are two parts to this. The first is the public hearing. Just as a brief reminder, uh, I'd like to go over the public hearing procedures, if that's all right, just as a reminder for everyone here in, in attendance. Um, we'll start with uh, disclosure of any conflicts of interest and in ex parte communications. I think we've already had one disclosure of, of um, conflict, well, it's not a conflict of interest, excuse me, but they're not available in person to participate. Um, so conflicts of interest would be any, any substantial interest that you have in the property or with the owner. Um, ex parte communications or any communications or information you've received outside of the public hearing process that other members of the board might benefit from that information re reaching their decision. Um, we'll come back to that in just a minute. I'll just provide a brief staff introduction. Um, the applicant, Mr. Robert Luhan, is here uh, this evening who can provide some additional context from their uh, mindset as, a, as the applicant. Then we'll allow public comments. We'll close the public comment portion of the hearing. Uh, the applicant and owner can uh, rebut or respond to any of those public comments. Staff will also make any closing uh, comments. And then we'll close the 
the item for the public hearing portion. So we'll move on to the second action item, which is consideration of ordinance. Any questions on the procedures? Okay, thank you for letting me explain that. Um, so moving on to just the, the introduction for this agenda item. Yes. So I did have a resident reach out to me um, and ask me for clarification on this property. There, I looked up something about the lot identification and parking and whatnot. So I did want to disclose that I did do some background investigation on that kind of stuff. But that's, I don't know if that affects anything in regards to this or not. Thank you, trustee. And I thank you for speaking up to you. Are there any other uh, disclosures of like conflicts of interest or ex parte communications? Thank you, trustee. Um, now I'll move into an introduction on the, the item. <laughs> um, this, this rezone request um, is for lot one and a portion of lot two, the north 15 feet of lot two of a very old plat of the town, 1903 was when the original plat was recorded. The property was developed uh, under a different set of standards at the time. And many of you have seen the uh, existing building on site that's also in, in pictures of historic downtown Wellington, um, was originally developed along a railroad spur, uh, was a historic railroad yard, uh, lumber yard, and more recently was used for a rental company with one residence included in that structure. Um, being completely transparent, the town staff did initiate a condemnation on this property. Um, some information was brought to our attention that we had to investigate. Um, and following that observations of the property, we did notify the owner um, that the property was found to be unsafe and dangerous and an unlawful structure. Um, the, we won't go into the details of that. The owner has been very uh, communicative with town staff in addressing all of those concerns and has made really great progress um, in bringing that building into compliance. The reason you're hearing this rezone request related to this is one of the challenges with the uses that were uh, in the property and what the, the owner would like to continue um, to make lawful um, was residential. And the property is currently zoned light industrial, which doesn't allow residential uses. Um, so that zoning compliance was a factor that needed to be resolved. And again, the owner's been very communicative and working through all the town's processes. Um, and to this point, it's the a request to rezone that property to C2 downtown core commercial, which does allow mixed use um, commercial and a residential component to it. And that is what they're, they're seeking is that C2 downtown core commercial. Um, we've gone through notifications for public hearings for the planning commission, <clears throat> excuse me, and the board of trustees um, the planning commission heard the request uh, at the September 12th planning commission meeting. And following that, that public hearing, um, the planning commission deliberated and adopted specific findings of fact. Those are included in your agenda packet with the planning commission's recommendation to approve uh, the request to rezone to C2 downtown core commercial. That recommendation was unanimous. Um, let's see, excuse me. I believe it was unanimous. There may have been one no vote. There's one no vote. Um, and the staff report from the planning commission meeting with all of those materials are also included in your agenda packet for reference. Um, so I'll, I'll pause. Thank you. Thanks, Trustee. Um, so, you, you've received all the information from the Planning Commission packet, as well as the Planning Commission's recommendation that's included in your agenda packet, including those specific findings of fact. And I think that's good background information on the process to date. Um, I, I hope everyone's familiar with the, the location that um, 8141 is the address and then the location maps included in your packet for reference. Um, at this time, Mayor Pro Tem, I'd turn it over to the applicant and owner if they have any uh, comments that they'd like to make. If it, a comment, really, I guess that's the anybody else can make a comment if they feel the need. Does the Board of Trustees have any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, we'll start with you, Trustee Teets. So, uh, in the, the goal and finality of this is to have a multifamily residential unit or a single? 
Mixed use. Mixed use. So do you plan to have many multifamily or one residential? Could be like three, either like townhouse or apartments, and then one commercial, whether professional office or retail, which, which, which fits the C2, the downtown development. Got it. That was my only question. Trustee Wiegand? Yeah, real quick. On the uh, multifamily, is that going to be off the main drag a little bit and you're going to have the commercial on the on the it's just one building oh just one building just there. one 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 portion of that brick building okay one right at the corner and you're just going to refurbish that brick building you got there now well there isn't, isn't much that needs to be done okay i mean there's not there's not a lot that i can do mm -hmm. um, but just try to work with the existing structure as best i can okay thank you trustee mason yes trustee gator mm -hmm. Uh, my question was already asked or asked with the use. And so I don't have a question because they already asked it. So, okay. Excellent. It's now time to open up the public hearing. Are there any comments from the public regarding the agenda item? Okay. With no further comment, the public hearing is now closed at 7 16 PM. We will now move on to ordinance number 15, 2022, an ordinance concerning a rezone request from L1 Light Industrial District to C2 Downtown Core Commercial District on Lot 1 and the north 15 feet of Lot 2, Block 9, Wellington Place First Subdivision. Opportunity for public comment on this rezone request was provided during the previous agenda item and public hearing is now closed. Are there any closing comments from the applicant this evening? Thank you. Mr. Bird, do you have anything that you would like to add? Um, I reiterate, um, uh, corroborate what Mr. Luhan said regarding the, the proposal. This is an existing structure. I, I apologize, I was looking at the wrong person. The existing structure that's going to be repurposed for the multifamily mixed use commercial development, not a, not a new, new site. Um, so I do concur with that. I, I would add that the, um, that was something that the planning commission felt very strongly about was making sure that the commercial component was included in the overall proposal to be in alignment with the zone district standards for C2. And then lastly, a great introduction, um, but your ordinance and I just wanna point out the ordinance in your packet was drafted for approval. Um, if you would like to see that amended in some way, um, you can certainly request that and staff is here to help you do that. Um, we did provide four different motion options um, for the board to consider. Um, in this task, you are tasked with adopting specific findings of fact, uh, taking action to either approve or deny the rezone request, um, and then taking action on that ordinance. Um, those uh, motion options were drafted with some assumptions. If you'd like to see any of those changed, um, we'd be happy to work with you on the specific language. Thank you so much for the clarification. Is there any further discussion from the board on this ordinance? Um, overall, I didn't um, have issue. I think that a lot of stuff was covered with the planning commission. Even my one concern that I have is that with the C2 mixed use, it the residential is really kind of supposed to be a secondary use. So it sounds like this property is gonna be primarily residential with a little bit of commercial sprinkled into it. Um, we, and again, it's industrial right now, so we can't do anything retail with it. So it's moving in a good direction. Um, I did have some concern that it's primarily going to be residential versus being primarily commercial with some residential. Like when we were going through the thought process of envisioning the C2 zone, it really was thinking like, you know, you've got the apart, you've got the business on the bottom apartment on the top type of a deal. So it's kind of like a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, outside of that, it, it reusing existing building, I think is great. Um, the only concern I have is just that it's really going to be primarily a residential use with a secondary commercial use versus the way it's intended, even written in our um, land use code, is that the primary use is commercial and then residential is a secondary use. But other than that, I don't have any other concerns with what the Planning Commission presented. I will second your concern. That was also one of my concerns, as well as the parking availability for up to three units of residential. 
Um, what I did know in looking at that property is, is when you look to the north of that property, there's no doors to access from Cleveland to that property that I saw. So I thought that was a, a bonus to making it appear to have that commercial feel and still remain the residential units. My main concern would be is setting a standard and we are okay with mainly residential and C2 and sprinkled commercial. Cody, maybe you can answer to that when we look at setting standards for parking availability and looking at the idea that if we're transitioning in the C2 district to a secondary residential use and prime commercial space, will that have set a precedent for someone moving forward that they could mainly use C2 as a residence with possible commercial? So I think some of, one of the things that was important in consideration of this particular rezone request is that it's an existing developed site and it's being repurposed for a different use that wasn't contemplated at the time the site was originally developed years and years ago. A lot of our newer standards have been added over the years that weren't ever contemplated in when, this, when these lots were laid out or when the structures were built. Um, this topic did come up with the Planning Commission also, and it was... Um, the sentiment of, of the planning commission was it's better to allow adaptive reuse of the existing structure than to not allow use of that site and end up with a vacant structure or to um, require uh, stipulations of our code that would force, you know, scraping off a historic looking structure. So that was definitely a consideration for this particular site that might be different from a new development site that doesn't have existing development on it. But keeping in keeping everything as historic as possible, this would support that. I, I believe it would. I mean, preserving an existing structure, I, I think that was clear from the planning commission's intent was that that was a, a, an objective to allow. And, and I think that um, Trustee Gator's comment that that the commercial is in, was intended by the code to be the primary use and residential secondary. I think that resonated with the planning commission as well. And they looked at the balance of do we hold tight to that commercial component and potentially lose a historic structure? Um, or do we allow this adaptive reuse to, I think you said it really well too, Trustee, to move it in the right direction. Um, and I think that that's really been clear in this case. And it's been that way in communications between staff and the applicant is how do we find the best fit possible for an existing site? So was some of the concern with that with like just saying if there's four to do two and two, is it just that realistically that site could only support one commercial use versus being able to support two commercial and two residential or because I understand like trying to keep the building is it something where the building could not support more of a balanced commercial and residential or I I believe all things are probably possible I, I'll, I'll simply state and then if if you care to call on the owner too for any follow-up questions um, the owner's original request was to uh, reuse the existing structure for all residential okay. and staff tries really hard not to interpret or, or sway an owner's request. Um, we do help guide to what is the best fit possible in this instance, communications with staff and the applicant guided them to a, a C2 request because it allows the mixed use commercial. Okay. The request was still, we would like to make this building multifamily okay. um, and the, through that process and the zoning that is the best fit in staff's opinion and the planning commission's recommendation resulted in, we think this is appropriate for the site and the use of that dirt, that ground, mm -hmm. um, but preserving the intent of the regulations to provide mixed use commercial. We know those those uses, the mix of, of tenants and residential could change in the future, whether with the current owner or a future owner. Um, but right now, the, this is the request that best fit the zoning and the, and the owner's intent. So if we zone this as a C2, and we pass what's presented here, could they just change that and do all residential or are they still required to do that portion commercial and residential? Great question. And that was the same comment came up at the planning commission and the response and sentiment from the commission was that the district only allows mixed use commercial. So if there's no commercial component, it would be out of compliance with the zoning. 
Mr. Bird, I have a follow-up question relative to that or, or the applicant, and you may have just answered my question with your answer. Um, how many, how many parcels are on this lot? Is it just one? Well, the, the background context of the, the property that is owned by this particular applicant is um, seven platted lots. Okay. It was built upon, there's two structures and an, and an outdoor storage yard that's all part of the current property. The north portion, which is just the lot one and half of lot two is proposed for the rezone. Okay. Um, so which portion of the property are you referring to in your question? Well, I guess um, my next, let me ask my next question because that may lead into to where I'm going with this. How are those assessed? Are those assessed as commercial or residential properties? Thank you. Perfect. The brick building. The brick building, as the county assesses it, is residential. Then the the building right behind it, the white building in the lot, is zone commercial. That is how the county looks at it. Okay. That's how I'm assessed every year. So they're assessing it based off of the the existing zoning. No. Or the that, use. There, that's exist. That's. That's what the county has come up with. That's what I've been faced with since I've owned it. And the previous owner what, that I'm aware of. Okay. Or owners. But the industrial is what they would, because it's not even. They're not, I'm not, I'm not sure they're even looking at that. They're, they're, like I said, I'm, I'm assessed on two different values, residential on the brick building, commercial on the, on the, on the, on the commercial and the lot. Okay, thank you. So. Um, with this change, how would that change your your assessed value by changing the zoning? I wouldn't change anything. It would, they it would, would be look the same. at it as they would say, okay, now now it fits, completely fits how they've been billing me every okay. year. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? I got a quick question. I presume in the process of doing all this, you're going to bring everything up to code? Yes. Perfect. And yes. I know some of the back buildings and I imagine in between the brick building and your the back side of that, that's all going to be parking for the units there. Is that correct? Uh, Cody can help me with this, but that's one of the struggles. Right. And it's one of the struggles with downtown Wellington. Mm -hmm. Parking. Where do we park? And we're trying, we're we're working together to try to figure that one out. Maybe, okay. maybe Cody can shed yeah. some light. Maybe that's commercial use because there's parking. <laughs> 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 Um, the and, and Mr. Luham's right. Um, the the downtown uh, parking is always a concern in, in any downtown. That was certainly one of the topics that was looked at very closely in the land use code update process. And we actually relaxed the parking standards for downtown uh, core commercial district because of the unavailability of, of parking on the streets. And if we require the highest number of parking spaces for every property off, off street, so on site parking, we wouldn't have any structures left or very few structures. And so there was certainly a balance that we struck in the land use code to, to be cognizant that there are parking needs in the downtown and we're not gonna satisfy them without sacrificing our commercial viability. Um, and so in this particular instance, what we're, what we're working with, with Mr. Luhan on is identifying the space between the existing structures. Um, it does appear to be wide enough to support uh, parallel parking and still have room for vehicles to pass through there. It'll be a little tight and we know that, but we're gonna find a way to, to make that work to meet the offsite parking needs as much as we can. And then there's on-street parking availability in the downtown as well. Typically when we what we see is residential uh, demand and business demand has some trade-offs in terms of, of max time of day or max parking need. Um, and we'll certainly take a look at that in considering parking requirements. But our, our goal is to provide as much off street parking as possible and knowing that we have some space on the streets for parking as well. I believe so. I'm, I'm doing some engineering work for Mr. Lujan, uh, doing CAD work and drawing up some- Do you mind introducing work. yourself real quick? Uh, Bill Starks. Thank you so much. Anyway, uh, one of the issues that we brought up also in the planning commission meeting was that there is uh, some parking that's being used now along the railroad. So people say, well, what's the easement? Well, the easement it basically is 65 or 85 feet. I can't remember if it was 85 feet. 
That was when there was a spur line running along the end of the building because that was a lumber yard at one time. When those spur lines are removed, so we are told by other uh, residents that are along the railway that the easement reverts back to 30 feet as a default. That allows about uh, 55 feet of free zone that actually belongs to Mr. Luhan because it reverts back when the when the spur lines are removed, the easement le lease goes back. Now, the trouble is, is trying to find the railroad's approval hmm. of that easement uh, reduction. But anyway, that also is one of the things that helps the parking situation is that if we can make an assumption, and it is an assumption that those uh, um, that that um, easement reverts back to 30 feet because then that allows and then this is the, this is the property right here in this kind of teal color mm -hmm. and there's a fairly large space because you know it's back here it's fairly narrow but here it's very wide that doesn't need to be there now because the spur lines have been removed and that does make for parking along that area just for some clarification thank you for the additional yeah. comment Real quick question. Currently, what are you using that property for? I know you said you got a uh, single family in there right now. Nobody's in there right now. Okay. And is um, part of it, you got storage for, uh, is there vehicles and stuff like that? Well, the, so what we're doing, we were working with, with the town, mm -hmm. um, trying to get, you know, what specifically can we have there? So there's a, a welding shop on two of the bays. So there's, there's six bays, but Two, two people renting it. Mm -hmm. Myself in one, and the welding shop in another. So they is that have, on the back side of the yeah, property? Yeah, on the back okay. side, on the white bay. So he's a welder, and so he stores a lot of his 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 vehicles and the equipment that he needs to do his work. Mm -hmm. And then I have some of my vehicles for the construction company also there, but there's not a need for a lot of it. So we're slowly removing a lot of them and to not be there anymore. That's kind of what I was looking at, seeing if that was just gonna be parking for the new development that you're gonna have there. And that would just make that area just look it me so out. I mean, I would, nice. You know, we could turn that into public parking and we I can find some other <laughs> use. <laughs> Let's work together and do True. that. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, at this point, I'm trying to find the best use for this space yes. is, is where I'm at. But still trying to keep the integrity of the of the property here. So, thank you, sir. Do we have any additional questions about the rezone request? So I think I appreciate the conversation. Um, while it does still concern me about having again be primarily residential, I appreciate adding some commercial in there. Um, what I think we should what I would be in favor of is approving this as is, because currently, as long as it says mixed use, it's mixed use. I think that we should go in and we can talk about this later with staff, but I think we should lay out if we want that, what that percentage should look like for mixed use, because if we don't set a precedent, do we wind up with one commercial and 38 residential units? And that definitely does not fit the um, character of what we were going for with that. So I think Moving forward, I think we should look at can we clarify what mixed use entails, like, you know, whether it's a one to one relationship, commercial, residential, or whatever. Um, but I think we do that at a later time. I think this is giving us an option to reuse this building, get it filled with something. And hey, if we can work something out and get more parking for downtown, I think everyone would be happy. <laughs> um, so I would be in favor of supporting that, but noting that concern, I think that is something we need to address in the code of spelling out what does mixed use look like and what is that relationship between commercial and residential on the, on which obviously you can do all commercial, but if we're gonna do more residential, I think we need to spell that out for future. I agree. Great, noted. All right, would anybody like to take a crack in a motion? Oh, do you want to do it? Oh, all right, give me a second. Go for Do it, we huh? want to discuss the findings of fact first, or are you good on that? I'm good with the findings of fact. Again, my my adjustments would not have anything to. It is brought up concerns by this property, but it does actions take need to be taken separate from this property. So, 
Any other discussions on the findings of fact? No, I agree with the findings of fact. The findings of mission is useless. I, I suppose the only thing I would say is, I mean, if it, it, it is pretty clear to me that the intent maybe of C2 is obviously to be mostly more, more, more commercial. That being the case, I would say that, you know, personally, I would say that the character of this rezone doesn't quite fit item A or B, I would say, um, but the rest of them, C, D, E, and F, I'm, I think I'm good with those. I would agree with that because that, that's, that's where the concern comes in. So I'm fine with leaving off those two and just going with C through F. So removing A and B? Just removing those two. Because those those are the ones where you have the question of does it it's not quite a fit, but it, it technically is a fit, but not quite what we might be looking for. But at this time it does fit under the C2. So until that changes, it would so because A talks about consistent with a comprehensive plan and the intent stated. So again, the intent as stated in the land use code does say commercial primary residential secondary this property truly is going to be a primary residential with a secondary use of commercial so it it, it fits legally it is still mixed use but if you actually look at the land use code um, it does state in their primary use is commercial and secondary use is residential so i would agree with trustee mason we can pull those two out and it's still it doesn't um, have an adverse effect uh, affiliates to services are good to be able to support that um, it is consistent with plans for the area um, to some level it is consistent with the goal of going to that area along Cleveland becoming C2 it's just the specific use might not quite be the best fit I'm sorry Cody how many findings of fact do we have to have in order for it to meet to approve is it four no, but but great question, and I and I I'm glad you brought it up. So in the board's consideration of findings of fact, I'm referring to your your agenda packet, page thirty two. Mm -hmm. It identifies findings A through F. That is straight out of the land use code. Um, those are the topics that the planning commission and the board have to consider. You don't have to actually concur on all of those. You don't, it doesn't have to be unanimous. Each board member can vote how you see fit based on the findings. The challenge that we, that we as a municipality are tasked with is we have to have a basis for an approval or denial. So in a, in a completely theoretical scenario, not related to anything that's been discussed tonight, if the board was considering the set of findings A through F and found all of them to be supported and then voted to deny, Myself and Mr. Sapienza would have no idea how to support that <laughs> in a court of law. <laughs> sure. So the, the findings are intended to provide a basis that an applicant come in and reasonably expect this is what's going to be considered, that the staff and the board and the planning commission all have the same set of findings that we're evaluating and then identifying through the, the public hearing process and through these deliberations, what are the factors that specifically speak to this particular request? There's no set number that have to be, you don't have to check a certain number of boxes. If there's one factor that outweighs everything else, that's how you can reflect when you vote for that agenda item. Is that, is that a helpful explanation? Very good. If there's any further questions, I'm certainly happy to answer. All right. Are you Ready, Mayor Pro Tem? I'm ready. All right. I'd like to move to adopt ordinance number 15-2022, approving C2 downtown core commercial district zoning for lot one in the north 15 feet of lot two, block nine, Wellington Place, first subdivision, based upon the board's finding of facts for approval and updating the official maps of the town. And those findings of facts are the rezone will not result, finding one, the rezone will not result in adverse impacts to natural environment, including air, water, noise, stormwater management, wildlife, and vegetation, or such impacts will be mitigated. Finding two, the rezone of the subject property will not result in material adverse impacts to the surrounding properties. Finding number three, facilities and services, roads, transportation, water, gas, electric, police, fire protection, and sewage and waste disposal are available to serve the subject property while maintaining adequate levels of service to existing development. And finding number four, 
rezone is consistent with any other prior approvals and official plans and policies created under the guidance of that plan for those areas. For example, the comprehensive plan, specific area plans like a downtown corridor study, etc. I'll second. Roll call, please. Trustee Gator. Yes. Trustee Daly. Oh, she sorry. Trustee Mason. Yes. Trustee Teets. Yes. Trustee Wiegand. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McDonald. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Moving on. Yes. Thank you so much. Reports this evening, Mr. Sapienza. My family, oh, this works. My family and I were fortunate to spend this past weekend in Grand Junction um, at a Colorado Municipal League law conference over the last uh, few days. It's a good opportunity to meet with attorneys from other surrounding communities and other other individuals. Um, Sam Light from Sursa was there, and um, I've already reached out to him to talk with him about maybe getting some additional trainings and. Uh, talking with the board about open meetings law, which I think Trustee Teese will talk about a little bit later. Um, important topics of that conference included First Amendment issues, taxation issues, and a lot more. And of course, being a legal conference, if you ask me very specific questions on any of those things, the answer that came out of it all was, it all depends. So <laughs> um, it brought a lot of clarity to a lot of things, but um, it was a good opportunity to represent Wellington and uh, meet other folks, so. Thank you for the update. Town Administrator, Ms. Garcia. No report tonight, thank you. Excellent. Uh, staff communications, any questions on the sheriff's report or the monthly utility report? Okay, we've got a fee schedule report. Um, Charity, do you have anything that you'd like to share with the board? I'm sorry, last name Charity. Thank you, Ms. Canfield. Um, good evening. So this is an introductory to our first adopted fee schedule. I wanted to give you the information out there for how the structure is going to work. Um, we don't have finalized numbers because we have not set our water and sewer rates, but this is just preliminary information for you guys to have prior to bringing a final document to be adopted. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, board reports. We'll start on this side and move that way. Trustee Gator. All right, um, so assuming I can make it work tomorrow, I'm actually looking forward to taking the bus into Fort Collins <laughs> to just kind of talk to our drivers, see how things are going. But we do have the bus running currently on Wednesdays and Saturdays from uh, Wellington into Fort Collins. I know some people have been asking like, oh, you have to spend all day. It is designed to get you in there if you have appointments and then bring you back at the end of the day. It's not designed as a back and forth multiple times. Um, I would encourage people, if you have questions, please reach out to myself. Um, if you have suggestions on how we can better improve that, that's part of this is it's a pilot program to just see what's working, what's not working. Will people use it so that if there is a need for it, we can come back, you know, hopefully next year and say, okay, what does this look like in partnership with Fort Collins and moving that forward? So um, again, excited to just kind of see where we come out on the on the end of that. Um, did also want to update everyone on October, I think it's fourth or I don't remember. It's a Wednesday. Um, we are going to be doing an appreciation lunch for the town staff. Um, so this is something that's um, I talked to the board about a few weeks ago about putting something together. So um, I've already got a couple of people on board with providing some barbecue. We've also got some drinks and provided. So what we're going to do is basically set it up to where um, I'll get all the businesses out. You can go to the business, whether you're a trustee or a member of the community who just wants to say, hey, I appreciate our staff. And they'll know, like, here's a tab for whatever they're providing. And you could just say, hey, I'd like to put 20 bucks or 15 bucks or however much you want to put towards it. And then they'll keep a tab of that. And then what I'm doing with the businesses I've brought on board is I've just let them know whatever the balance is at the end, I will make that up out of my pocket. So if there's like $5 left, I'll pay that. If it's, you know, the whole amount is still left, I'll, I'll pay whatever that is. Um, so if you know of any businesses that would like to participate and be a part of that and just saying thank you to staff, um, please reach out to them. And then just let me know so I have a list so I know how much food we've got. And if we need to get more, I want to make sure that we provide enough for everyone. I know Patty's working on getting us some rough numbers on who we can expect to show up, but uh, that will be happening I mean, October, 5th. October 5th. Okay. And that is a Wednesday and it'll be from 12 to one. 
right here at the Leaper Center. And so we can come by if you guys are able to, and really it's just an opportunity for us as a community to just to say thank you to our staff. So looking forward to that. Um, uh, Trustee Gator, real quick clarification on that. Did you say that you were gonna pay for the balance out of that, out of your personal pocket? That is correct. Well, thank so, you so much for offering that. I just wanted to okay. extend, I'd be happy to help split that sure. cost with you as well. So do keep yes. us posted. I will, absolutely. And, and so the goal is, is that all of us as a community can come in and say, hey, we appreciate the staff. We're going to buy you guys lunch. But the goal again is it's not, we're not paying this out of taxpayer dollars. It's coming out of individuals stepping up and saying, hey, I want to say thank you. Um, but for me, because this is my idea, right? When I go to a business and say, can you provide this? I'm letting them know, hey, Whatever's not made up, I will make good at that at the end. So I will get that list out to everyone. Or I'll get it to Ms. Garcia so she can then <laughs> get it out to everyone. Um, and then I'll also make sure that list is available for the community. So if you guys would like to join us in just showing appreciation to staff, community members will have the opportunity to just go up to the businesses and say, hey, I'd like to pitch in $15 towards the, the lunch for staff. Great. So, Thank you so much. Okay, yep. carry on. Um, the only other thing I wanted to highlight is um, I think it's Saturday. Um, one second. The 15th of October, I will be getting an email out. Um, I'm basically just a couple of Saturdays ago, I just did like an office hour where I just said, hey, I'll be at Ziggy's Coffee if people want to come and ask questions, meet with your elected officials. I decided that like the day before. <laughs> so I did get notice out to everyone, but it was like literally or two days before, I think. Um, so I know several people said, hey, we'd like to do that. Please just give us more advance notice so that we could come. So I will get the information out, but that'll be the 15th of October is a Saturday. It'll be from 11 to 12. Um, I'll have Ms. Garcia can post that so it's properly posted online, but really it is just an opportunity if anyone wants to come from the board and just invite members of the community to come and just sit and chat if they want to. So just want to let you guys know, try to do that in more advanced notice this time around. So that's all I got. Excellent. Uh, Trustee Daly, do you have any board reports that you'd like to share? I do. Um, the first one is that the Wellington Middle High School homecoming week is next week. So I hope everybody has on their schedule October 7th is the homecoming game. Um, so that will be very exciting for our community. So I'm loving that. And I know there's a whole troop of tiny cheerleaders that are planning on performing during halftime. So uh, one of them is my kid. So it's going to be super fun. And I hope everybody participates. Uh, the second thing is the for the Wellington Main Street um, program that we're looking on. Uh, Dave may have some updates uh, in addition to me. Excuse me, Trustee Wiegand. Um, but everything's going along really well. They're finalizing that proposal, uh, bringing together all the things, including technical and legal language um, for any updates that would be proposed to uh, memorandums of understanding between different organizations, including DOLA, the town, and the Wellington Main Streets program. Um, so that's going through kind of the approval process with um, the Main Streets program um through their board and then we'll bring it to our our board as well for discussion and potential approval of that so i'm very excited about that um, and then lastly i've been getting uh, people have been reaching out to me all across the country at this point uh commending us for our efforts uh to protect the freedoms that, of our library and the mission of our library um it's been very humbling and wonderful i mean every people from my elementary school teachers um, to all kinds of things and above. So it's been incredible to see that Wellington is making such an impact on the entire country. So I wanted to share that um, and I hope that we can be a shining example for that in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Trustee Daly, Trustee Mason. All good. Trustee Wiegand. Trustee Teets. I have three things this time around. Um, so I had a chance to meet with um, our town attorney, Mr. Sapienza, and go over some kind of breaking down the CAC's function and operations and seeing how that pertains to our new town ordinances compared to when it was originally written in, I think, 1981, 82. Um, so and looking at that and kind of seeing how the CAC functions, exploring generalized ideas of what the CAC would do as far as developing surveys, getting feedback from residents, and then putting, having the town liaison put together a package from requests for providers to actually present to the CAC to make tweaks and suggestions and then have that package actually presented 
to the board of trustees for approval for an event. So it means that our trustees would be approving the details of the event, the cost included in that event, where it would remove the CAC from voting and allocating taxpayer dollars, because um, it was my understanding, and Mr. Sepianza, correct me if I'm wrong, the CAC shouldn't be allocating money in taxpayer dollars for planning. It should definitely be a board of trustees thing. And having it presented in a package this way makes it to where all of our board gets to see and hear the planning going on, give feedback and send that feedback through a trustee liaison to that CAC board for any tweaks or recommendations with their approval or an ask to adjust something to that package. So it kind of makes it to where we still have our residents involved, volunteering, getting out and about in the community but that legality and liability makes um, Mr. Sapienza a little less stressed out. And hopefully that helps with some kind of the financial aspect of what the CAC is supposed to be doing. Um, they're not doing anything wrong, but how it's been written and with our rules not changing in so many years, the town rules did and CACs remain the same. So it's just getting that stuff worked out and evened out. I plan on sending um, all of the items that I had found and recommendations to Dan to kind of look at and make sure that this coincides with what our ordinances sit as now. Um, also sponsorship opportunities and packages. And then I would like to sit down and have the discussion with the CAC and see where they would also like to go, feedback that they would like to give back as a commission, not a board, because the CAC shouldn't be a board, it should be a commission. Um, I found out all kinds of interesting stuff in our meeting. But I think that this will help streamline, but also let our board of trustees be involved in these decisions. So if there is issues that come up, they can say, well, we, yes, we knew about this. Yes, it's something that was addressed and discussed, and this is the way the CAC moved forward with it. I think the way it's working out, I think it'll be awesome. It's just making sure that we are doing everything above board. So that's as far as the CAC items go. Um, the second thing is last Wednesday on the 20th, we had a minor... Uh, well, is it last Wednesday? No, last Tuesday, we had a bit of an issue with a text message string that was sent out. And I would like to cure that issue and open up the discussion for allocation of the tickets that we receive as paying for our membership to the chamber. Um, so just a, a standard discussion. It doesn't have to be anything official. I just want to make sure that we have it in an open meeting with the public available because we do need to do that according to the sunshine laws, to my understanding. I, I can give a little background on that Got just it. perhaps. Um, the question was whether uh, some text messages were going around about scheduling regarding a, a community event and um, Trustee Teets was concerned that essentially allocating the free tickets that were given to the town was public business that needed to be done in an open meeting. Uh, the Colorado Open Meeting Law with relation to emails is not the clearest of things. Um, it certainly allows emails among board members for discussion of scheduling for their specific things that are exempted, such as sending information or posing questions for later discussion. The idea though is in an email, in a text, in any time you're not in a public noticed meeting, no public business be discussed. And so the question would be whether allocation of tickets were was public business. And I think you certainly could go a lot of directions on that. However, if Trustee Teets believes that it is public business on allocation of those tickets, um, curing a open meetings law violation, with if this was, and I certainly it's not my opinion that it necessarily was, um, but if it were a violation, um, then a discussion now in a note in a public meeting would cure that violation. And so she had a she wanted to discuss what was discussed in the text messages. Is that questions on that? 
And this is why earlier I mentioned opens meeting, open meetings law and possibly get CERSA in. Just to give a refresher on that, I think you all got an introduction by CERSA when you were just brand new trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of other things going on. So uh, perhaps bringing them in um, for a refresher on that would be helpful. I have a question, Mr. Sapienza. Do we have that that narrative of that text message available for this discussion? I do. I'm sure that I know we all do. But all right. Ms. Teeth, I guess, would you like to, to read that real quick? Um, so it says, hi team, curious if anyone else is planning on attending the chamber's annual dinner. The town received four tickets from the chamber. I wanted to plan and ensure I bought tickets if others were planning on attending. I responded, I am tentative for attendance. Um, oh, that's okay. I think that's, I just, just not the whole dialogue of the conversation. I was just curious what the, oh, you know, okay. just to what read I'm, to the, the, the what I'm unity. questioning. Oh, yes. okay. So, so read my, just that text message and that text message was from no I'm sorry let me Trustee finish daily yep so let me finish it said um I am tentative I just asked Patty if she and her husband will go I think giving them the tickets would be a nice gesture and that's where it enters our gray area because we pay for the membership to the chamber it's two thousand dollars a year and those tickets come with our paid membership once you cross into that gray area and you start allocating taxpayer dollars to somebody, that is when it should have come back to an opens meeting discussion. I don't mind the scheduling. I love hearing about the events. I mean, honestly, if it wasn't for Trustee Daly, I probably would miss half the events going on in town. I'm glad. I just don't want to enter into anything that puts us in a gray area that can be core requested and brought up later to question integrity of our board, because I don't think anyone has ill intent in the planning on our board. It's just clarifying that I am only interested in discussing scheduling. I'll be there. No, I won't be there. Hey, this meeting's going on. I think we discussed at our last, our work session that we are gonna bring something back as far as what that text messaging looks like. It's not the idea of saying, are you attending? Are you not attending? It was the general idea of not only saying that she would like to allocate taxpayer dollars, which are those tickets, they don't come free with our membership, it's paid membership, the residents of this town can't go get a free ticket, they have to pay $50 from my understanding for a ticket. So that's when it becomes a public issue. And then the second part of that is where trustee Daly told me, I see the disconnect, you buy your own tickets personally. Also, you cannot address that and say any of that, that all needs to be part of a public comment, open meetings record. The scheduling itself isn't the issue. It was what came after. I don't want to live in a gray area on our board. So, and that was my only thing. And that's why I reached out to Dan was to ask how to cure that. So if it ever did come up, we did the right thing at our next meeting by addressing it and just saying, I'm going, I'm not going, I need a ticket, I don't need a ticket. So if they were free tickets, I don't know if that would have been an issue, but these weren't free. They come with a $2,000 paid membership. Okay. Are we cured? If you feel like a discussion's been had, then I think so. Okay. I mean, it, does the board want any further violated. discussion on this? I have a quick comment. Okay. Um, Just yeah. Daly? Yeah. So one thing to keep in mind is as chamber members, it is for the entire town. Uh, that includes staff, not just for our board as chamber members, the entire town um is is the chamber member so i do want to point that out but now that we are talking about this in public meeting um who's going to be using the tickets do we have an idea or who's going to allocate them i don't think this needs to take the public's time so much time how to do it to see who's going to go to the party but if you guys want to do this through a public conversation i'm happy to do that um i already i have a ticket thank you to trustee weekend i really appreciate that very much <clears throat> and Mayor Pro Tem uh, McDonald does as well. Is anybody else planning on using the remaining tickets? I do not plan on using a ticket. 
I am out of town and I actually like the idea of offering them to uh, Ms. Garcia and her husband if he'd like to join her at that. I, I think it's a great idea and I'm happy to to give them two of the tickets. I, I know I can't attend. I'm going to be down in the mountains. So uh, I had already suggested to Ms. Garcia that we have them uh, shopped around a staff if staff would like them. Um, outside of that, uh, if if there happens to be a ticket left, I might take it. If there doesn't happen to be a ticket left, I'll buy one. So no big deal. Okay, great. Um, I believe that the intent behind the communication was to coordinate um, schedules for a special event. It was not intended to allocate town funds or tickets. It was simply coordinating who's going and who's not going. So if there were extra tickets, we could have a conversation to allocate them. I appreciate Trustee Teets's diligence and attention to detail and the opportunity for discussion for this exercise. Would you like to um, continue your board reports? Yes, I just have one more. Um, I get to have the privilege of watching my husband swear his oath of allegiance here in the United States on Friday. So I am extremely excited to get to see that side of government and get to appreciate that my husband will now be an American citizen. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing. Excellent. I have no further updates with that. We will go into a work session following this meeting. I'd like to go ahead and, oh, did I miss somebody? All right. Can we please adjourn and take a five minute recess? Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? We'll reconvene at 810. 10 years. Ten years has been an application process. No, so I mean, no, the the thing is, is we kind of uh, it was one of those things morning. where everyone's like, I didn't get the marriage one. Um, he didn't want to. He, no, wanted he to did it right. He wanted it's like you to the right. I think it's for Paul and David. You know, I've been late at lunch meetings for crazy things. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm talking technical. Find some time. We need to catch up. Yeah, um, you know, we don't see each other much. Uh, yeah, we can I'll even do it next week. Find some time. Okay. Next week. Okay. Yeah, we'll make it work. We'll. Yeah, so good luck tonight. No, we'll see you. Come on. Yeah, we'll see ya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we still need. Yeah, we do need to do the work session. Okay. Oh, God. You really need to stand still. I know, I'm so glad for that.
We're going to now resume the, or we're going to start the work session at 8, 10 p.m. Um, please note that there's no public comment taken during work sessions. Um, and this evening we have Ms. Campfield, Megan, and Mr. Gowing um, available for questions. And as we've also invited Mr. Barane, excellent, the, our finance committee chair liaison to join us this evening for this discussion. Uh, our first item on the agenda this evening is the 2023 budget work CIP. And we also have the 2023 budget sewer CIP. Do we have any questions this evening from the board? Do we wanna start on this side and work this way? Or John, would you like to kick us off this time? Trustee Gator. I don't have a problem going first, but I'm happy to let other people go first as well. I, I did have several questions, which I emailed to staff, but I, I can go whenever you want me to. Fire away, please. All right. Have the right spreadsheet pulled up this time. You're asking questions and you let me know what page you're on because I might be able to cross off. Some oh, okay. Um, sure. Oh, so I don't know which page it is. I'm looking at the water CIP first. Sorry, I'm looking at the spreadsheets, not at the packet. packet. So it's probably like page three, I'm guessing, because I think water was first. Um, so it's going to be line number six, which is vehicle replacements. That was the first question I had. Um, so we're replacing a 2008 Chevy 1500. Uh, my questions were how many miles are on the truck? What shape is it in? And is the truck currently unsafe for us to continue using? Okay. And thank you for sending those questions, Trustee Gator. That's handy to get those in advance. Um, this is a replacement for 2007. It's got over 130,000 miles on it. And frankly, it's just not very reliable. Our, our goal is to get at least three reliable vehicles at each plant for the main reason that they deliver a lot of samples for testing for compliance purposes. There's chain of custody issues and, and time frames from when you have to get that down there. And we ha have had some of those stranded in the past. So okay. our, again, our goal is to have three reliable vehicles. So we would like to um, replace and almost certainly decommission sell that existing truck, which is now, you know, Quite old. I can't do that. Yet. So old. I can't do the math in my head. <laughs> oh, 15 years. I, I can. But being dramatic. Sorry. Okay. So have we had the the stranding issues, reliability issues? Have we had that with that vehicle? That one has has given us problems. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, the second question I had on the water CIP, so it's lower down line 19, uh, tank aeration study, uh, and was questioning what that's for, which tanks are we talking about here, and then also um, what is the impact of doing the aeration? What what does that benefit us getting that accomplished? That That is to the the two, for the two big tanks, okay. the one gallon, uh, one main gallon and two main gallon at the main treatment plant site. Um, stratification, so this would be pretty much a stratification study. So without any kind of mixing, the water in the tanks will uh, create thermal and chemical stratification, um, just like the reservoir that flips every so often. And when, when it flips, and it, it can flip, but that creates a um, unpredictable quality of water throughout the, the tanks. And this would almost, most of this fees would simply be for uh, testing temperature and water quality at different elevations in different um, weather conditions. You know, the summertime is usually the most problematic where you get the, the largest thermal stratification, but it can happen in the wintertime too. Um, so we want to understand it better in order to determine the the right solution, mainly because it's creating compliance issues for us in terms of chlorine residual. Um, it can also create um, biologic activity that you don't want in your potable water tanks. So um, we think that that budget, frankly, is a little bit high, but um, I don't think we're going to be able to come in substantially under that. Okay, I shouldn't say substantially, somewhat under that. Okay. So just so I understand, basically, this is the study of what type of aeration, what the aeration does, if we do that, will help with clearing up quality of water, making sure that the water that's sitting in the tanks isn't having issues happening to it. It's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, the line 25 pre-treatment facility improvement concrete, um, is that separate from the main expansion? I was a little confused as to what that's for because then we have the separate line item for all the expansion. It upgrades. is, we didn't include a whole lot of improvements at pre-treat in the expansion project, focusing mainly on just the ability to pump up there. So right now we have a gravel slash dirt driveway going down that hill and tracking mud in and out. So we really just want to get some concrete. Uh, this would be a project that we perform with in-house staff uh, doing the concrete work. So the 20,000 is pretty much materials only base and, and concrete mud. I forgot to mention that we have Nathan Ewart in, with oh. us as well, in case there's a question I can't answer. Um, so this is probably the line 32. This is the water efficiency program. Um, this is probably, well, so just the question I have for you, Mr. Gowling, and then the other question is really for the board. Um, with the 25,000 that's slated in 23, is that, because I know in the description it says we'll be doing some stuff with meters, some will be done with studies, is because I see the number in 24 and 25 is much more substantial. In 23, are we anticipating that being meters that are going out, or is that more studies and communication, turn this, turn this et cetera? Megan. Okay. Megan Smith, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, Patty, can I ask, did we, uh, I believe Hallie sent a breakdown of that 25,000 and it, that went to uh, trustee Teets, perhaps we could forward that out, but it did, it did include um, a, a few, I think maybe 10, I think the estimate was maybe about eight or 9,000 of it could potentially end up going to completing the AMI networking infrastructure project that we currently have um, undergoing this year. Uh, but the bulk of that 25,000 was looking at this year, tackling some water efficiency programming and some communication and education materials. Um, yeah. I just sent that out. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, so thank you for answering that portion. So then the question to the board, um, I understand like if we're putting meters actually in the pits and things like that, that is directly tied to that. Um, aside from my questions of whether we should be expending money on um, water efficiency, that is part of our strategic plan that the board approved. Um, one of the discussions, and Dominic can speak to this as well, with the finance committee was trying to pull everything we possibly could out of the water and sewer funds in terms of projects to put in the general fund, because every dollar we spend out of the water and sewer fund has to come from either a tap fee or it comes from a resident's pocket in terms of a rate. Mm -hmm. So even though it may not always be big things, if we can do things. So for example, if we're saying we're going to be doing communication around water efficiency, that's not really a water treatment plant issue. That is, we as the trustees in the town are saying we want to educate our residents. So it would be better to have that in the general fund. So if, if we say we still want to spend the money, we still want to do the studies and communication, so be it. But can we move that out of the water fund so that again, it helps to decrease even just a little bit of that load on the enterprise fund, and then have that as a general fund CIP? I agree with that. Um, I see the breakdown here is 10,000 in marketing and communication materials, 3,000 in resource central irrigation audits, um, 2,000 in garden in a box, 1,000 in demonstration gardens, and 9,000 in the AMI networking materials. Does that 9,000 need to stay in the AMI networking materials as far as the sewer? So, so do we only separate out the... If we're dealing with direct infrastructure that's connecting to the water plant, so whether that's the meters, whether it's part of a network or whatever, I don't have a problem with that being in there because it is directly tied. But when we start talking about like gardens and things like that, not saying we don't do those, but that really, I would say, pull that out of the enterprise fund, put that in the general fund. Um, yes, we still have to figure out what are we going to cut in the general fund to do that, but at least it takes a little bit of that burden off the enterprise fund. I respectfully disagree. I think it's important to keep those separate for historical accounting purposes. It shows uh, trends over time, the impact for investing in that specific method 
for water efficiency, whether or not it has an impact relative to that fund specifically. So if you start mixing that money in with the general fund, it makes it difficult later on to justify the historical impact that that truly actually had on that fund. So keeping that, because it's, you're not advertising something that's a general operating expense. That advertising and marketing is specific to water efficiency. The intent of water efficiency is to take the demand off the water treatment plant, which is a, you know, directly related, related to the water enterprise fund itself. So what we're trying to do is measure the impact to our water enterprise fund, as well as improve conservation or impact to our treatment facility. And so keeping those separate over time provides that historical knowledge. Because if we mix that into the general fund, a board of trustees 10 years from now that is trying to compare that information over time, that could be just lost or mixed in with general advertising, not specific to what we're trying to achieve. So I would prefer to keep that separate. Do we not track where we're investing? If say, if we did marketing and communications to um, the residents for water conservation, do we not track that? Is that not something that can be pulled up at a later date to see that, okay, this is well, with the way municipal accounting software works is you have the line item that it's tied to. Now, if you want to track a specific thing that's in a, a line item, there could be multiple things that are built to that. So you would have to pull each historical invoice. So the availability to pull it out is a little more extensive. Um, I think Trustee McDonald's point is that when you move it to the general fund, you are no longer separating your enterprise and your general funds. So I would say I can see it from both sides, but if this is a purpose to drive specific water usage in a specific trend, it would make more sense to be in the enterprise. Fund. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as Ms. Camfield alluded to, I don't think there's, it's not a right or wrong answer necessarily. There's, okay, what do government accounting auditing standards allow? And to Trustee Gator's point, flower boxes, they might not necessarily be like traditional enterprise related items, but at the same time, there is a trade-off, right? You lose some comparability. Uh, future boards of trustees won't have the same knowledge and insight into methods, expenses, things we've used to try to um, enhance conservation efforts, there's a trade-off, right? There is a choice. I wish I had like, a, oh no, standard like 10-3 says this. It's not quite as clear as that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to minimize the balance in all the activity in your enterprise accounts, which pass through directly to the taxpayers? Or do you want to preserve comparability year over year? Do you want to enhance like future board's ability to analyze this. It's a trade-off. Right? The board needs to make a choice. So that's my question then. So if so in looking at that, if we leave it in this fund, it will be a direct handoff to residents as far as cost. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Got it. Thank you. I guess to reiterate, like we, the finance committee would not, and we want to, to, to validate this 100% with government standards, right? And just make sure we're not doing anything out of bounds. But um, my instinct here, I'm just having a little bit of government audit experiences that we're not. Um, it's a little bit of a judgment call. You're going to see different towns handle this slightly differently, mm -hmm. depending on how you frame the costs, right? And then there's a narrative story to tell and it's, it can go either way. We're not we wouldn't be doing it, doing anything explicitly out of bounds, I don't think. But if charity were to find something that said, like, "Hey, this, you know, this verbiage makes it pretty clear." And yeah, we would lean kind of one way or the other, depending on what that says. So, just make sure that's all good. Um, yeah. I think there's just a choice here. I think it's an overall gray area, and I, the question is, in the overall scheme of things, what is the financial impact per resident for this amount? 
And if you break it down, very small. Yeah. No, and I, I don't disagree that it's, I'm not saying it's, you know, $5 million that we're, we're making out of there, but it is something that I think that we need to be cognizant as we're doing things is, are we going to go the route of, we're just going to keep anything and everything there. And, you know, if that means people have, again, at this point, it's not a huge amount. That means higher bills for our residents. Then that's understanding that versus saying, is this truly something that is only specifically because of the water enterprise? because it really, to me, is more of a, we're bringing this up because there are concerns about water in general just being a scarce resource and that's utilized all through the town. And it really is, when we're talking about education and things, I would say that that's separate from just a water enterprise. But again, that's a decision we as a board have to, to make. We can put it either way and it's not, I mean, people aren't gonna see their water bills jump because of this one item, but it's that how we choose to look at that moving forward that also affects other items that we could go either way. When we start putting all of those into that, it's good, those things start to add up over time. So that's my concern. And I, I think would also say that this may be a concept of overall accounting practice and what we want to implement moving forward. How do we want our budget to look like? How transparent do we want it? Do we want to make sure that we are tying every enterprise expense to the, our enterprise system, mm -hmm. or are we wanting to keep it fluid as maybe we have done in the past. So, and I, I agree with keeping enterprise expenses. What I would say is when we talk about educating residents, I would not call that an enterprise specific expense. When we're talking about meters, when we're talking about the networking and stuff that goes behind that, I absolutely agree that's an enterprise specific expense. If we as a board are saying we want to educate our residents and tell them how to better use water, I would see that separately from an enterprise specific expense. Well, and I well would say um, excuse too, me, Ms. Camfield. So Trustee Heater, I guess what I, I it's not necessarily that the education piece that we're funding education, what we're looking at and the question that we've asked ourselves is, are our conservation efforts making an impact on our water utility users? Are, is the staff time that we're investing in the advertising, educating the community specifically to trying to um, salvage or you know, maintain our system as long as possible. I, we're not asking or educating people about landscaping standards. We're educating them about specific um, use of our water system. And the question is, is if we're investing in this education for conservation, is that having a direct impact on our water users utility bill? And if we're not identifying that through our water enterprise fund budget, how can we use that as a comparable that it's making a difference or not on our water utility users at all? Services. It says mailers, translation services, signage, flyers, et cetera, is the highest cost in this of $10,000. And so I would say that we have the ability, if we're spending things out of a line item, to see what has been spent out of that line item. We can see it was $10,000, and separately we can see have bills gone up or down, has water usage gone up or down. While it might be sitting in a different fund, we can still see what has been. It's not like if we put it in the general fund, we will not be able to look at what did we spend on water efficiency. We will now, instead of having a light item in the enterprise fund for water efficiency, we'll have a line item in the general fund for water efficiency that will say we spent $15,000. And so we still do have the ability to look at that and say, okay, what did we spend here? We spent $15,000. Okay, over the last year, what impact did we see in residence bills? We saw a 5% drop in that. We can still get that information. So it don't you want that water efficiency piece broken down and what's the thing being spent on advertising? You can within that. But that's not being split out here either. Just because it's in the water fund, it wouldn't be. We still had have the one line item here in the water fund. So it's not like if we move it to the general fund, it's going to be this. It's all of a sudden going to lose all the information that we would have had in the, enter, in the enterprise fund. We'll have the same information. It's just going to be located in a different place. I think that that's a huge disservice to future boards. And I'm, I'll just leave it at that. I've shared my thoughts and opinions on that. And I think that um, I'd be interested to hear the other trustees thoughts on that, or we can move on. Also, the trustees are thinking, I just want to reiterate like the, the accounting standards or like best practices we're going for here. Um, not to say that moving this to the general fund would definitely be like the first step in a, a slippery slope, so to speak, but being cognizant of what of strict 
fund accounting and just having a really comprehensive detailed view fund by fund like the true activity moving framing something to be in the general fund could potentially be the first step of more i'll say slightly sloppy accounting practices to just frame things into the general fund as much as you can because if you look you know these these are accounting philosophy right if you look at it in a certain lens in a certain way it kind of looks like general fund if you look at it through this eye water fund if you look at it through this eye right like that could i would be hesitant to recommend like continuing to push into the general fund but so from what i'm seeing here is that's probably what you'd recommend keeping it where it's at the efficiency here would be better is that correct and we can still cut if we have to i mean it's still just like any other line item out there that it can be controlled if we have to cut something out of the budget this is my personal opinion um i would keep it where it is it's not going to materially impact taxpayers um that's a lens i look at, at things through it's cleaner accounting, but it's not wrong to put it in the general fund, right? It's just, hey, let's be cognizant of what we're trying to implement, best practices accounting from like the staff's point of view here. We're in like, you know, particular times right now, right? Like we have some kind of overbearing issues that might dictate how we want to do things temporarily. But if it was just me, I'd probably keep it where it is. Yeah, so I I guess I would say, honestly, I could probably go either way on it. I can kind of see both sides, but I think the bigger point here is that we know what the breakdown for the 10,000 that is, that is going to efficient, efficient, yeah, efficiency. And I think bigger than that, it's not that we'd be, we are putting any, any additional burden or anything like that on top of residents. The fact is, it doesn't matter where where the money is coming from, the taxpayer is having to pay for it anyway, right? And this is not something we've changed, right? We've been paying for an efficiency program for years. So uh, quite frankly, I'd be inclined to say, maybe let's keep it where it is. Like I said, we do have a breakdown that says exactly what we're spending on materials and that sort of thing. So uh, that's all I got. Okay. What else do you have, Trustee Gator? Line 36, uh, fire hydrant replacement. Um, the 72,000, I was curious, how many hydrants does that pay for? And of the ones that we're replacing, how many of those are in dangerous or failing shape currently? That's at least four, probably okay. more. Um, all of these fire hydrants are very old. They don't meet current standards for flow. Um, I would say that it's dangerous. If the fire department rolls up and they crank it and it falls apart, that, that wouldn't be acceptable for anybody. That's exactly what I need to know. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, those are all the questions I had for the water CIP. So do we want to go around the other table, get everyone else's? I have other ones for sewer CIP, but I don't know if you want to go finish going through water before we come back to my questions we, for sewer. We did have a prepared answer for your question, which I didn't get to give. Uh, oh, would well, it be appropriate it, for me to do that now? Please, you put so much effort um, in, please do. I'm just going to read it. <laughs> Uh, all activities that effectively manage water demand result in reduced cost. Reducing cost is one of our primary goals in the water utility. Um, the general fund also cares about that, but that's our responsibility. Examples of those cost savings are delaying future expansions, uh, other infrastructure capital costs, reduced raw water costs, which we all know is skyrocketing based on demand, and reduced wear and tear on equipment. So that's why we have that in here. Thank you. Excellent. Do you have any questions regarding the water CIP? No, no questions. You guys have done a great job with the notes over here. Uh, very impressed. So to appreciate that. Trustee Wiegand. I'll start it and then I'll pass it off to her. Uh, the very last item on there, the uh, water purchase for 2.5 million. Just is that tying up money or how's that going to impact? And I, my question is, you know, after what we did with the purchasing of the land out there that, you know, we were told that, you know, it's just kind of like having stocks, bonds, whatever else. Uh, dollars and cents wise is the water shares appreciating that much where that's going to be a good investment down the road or what 
why is the reasoning behind it? I think Megan will take care of this one. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So it in the note, I was hoping that the note would kind of explain a bit of it. So this is coming from our raw, our raw water fund. I guess it's not, it's not an, its own enterprise fund, but it is an allocated protected fund of money within the water fund. So those are coming from sources. One, I just want to differentiate those in that green. Those are coming from sources of funding that have zero impact on water rates. Um, two, allocating those dollars is an ability, allows us the ability to purchase water in 2023 should some become available that meets what we need at a price that we're willing to pay for it. So it's not us saying that we're hitting the ground uh, with a, a, a real estate agent looking for the water, um, but if we don't have it allocated in a, in a budget, we can't buy anything. Um, so that was kind of our ability to um, assign some of that expected and that those numbers are that kind of 2.35 million was based on our estimated conversion of the kind of the equivalent of if we got all wet water for those, I think 80 is the uh, building permit number that we're have utilized throughout all of the um, budget development this year or for 23. Um, that would be that number that comes across with that. That's sort of the cash equivalent value. Um, so that's kind of what it's there for. Does that answer your question? Question. I mean, I'm from Illinois, so water stuff is completely different from what I've ever had to understand. Uh, I know when we were going and talking about originally what we were going to be doing here as far as the water plants and purchasing and all this type of stuff, uh, you know, they were saying, or I thought I understood that we had plenty of water. We just didn't have the uh, ability to treat it right. Is that right? And why are we buying more? Or, I mean, is that a good investment for us? Is the main thing. So the other line item that you'll see in green there is a water source development plan. And so that is what we really need to tackle internally. Well, it will have outside consultants involved in that as well to determine how much volume of water we do think we're going to need to make to assure that we have available water um, to build out okay. uh, capacity through whatever level of, to, to meet whatever level of service we deem policy driven level of service that the board deems we want to meet, which means how reliable do we want to be with the you know, the amount of water that we have available to us. And then how will that change and be impacted through varying weather conditions into the future and varying legal ramifications of ongoing Western water law yeah. and Colorado so right River now we issues. Have, what, 74 shares. So that will increase the volume that we'll have available down the road. Is that right? You mean this purchase? Yeah. With the and it could be of, of a variety of other water. So there's other water out there, not just North Poudre shares. So that's what this water source development plan, the study will illuminate for us is what are the variety of other sources of water that we can pursue um, for the town that will diversify our portfolio, make us more resilient to a variety of, of environmental, economic, and climate situations. Um, and that water would be available for any of those kinds of purchases, whether it's secure. I mean, it could, we could, whether it's investing in Aaron Millions pipeline from Flaming Gorge or, okay. um, or buying land, so, anything like that. We yeah. can use it. So. It's like investing, investing in silver instead of gold. Yeah. It's okay. a, just a different investment option. Mm -hmm. yeah, one clarification to like, is this a good use of the funds? So understanding, I don't know the exact number. I'm guessing there's somewhere in eight to 10 million range. I know we bought some water in the last couple of years in the raw water. Where that came from is prior to 2021, I think was when we changed the rate, the um, fees for development. A lot of developers it was cheaper for them to give us cash instead of bring a water share because you're supposed to bring a water share basically um, when you develop. But prior to those changes made, and I think it was 21, it was cheaper for developers to just give us the cash than to give us the water fare, the water share. Well, that cash can only be used for water development of sources. That's where this money comes from. And so it can't be used for really anything other than studying how to develop water and buying water shares. It's literally sitting there specifically for the purpose of buying shares of water so that we can provide services down into the future. So we couldn't do anything else with the money, even if we wanted to. Okay, thank you, Trustee Gators. 
Megan might want to stay up there because I have some additional questions on that one. Okay. okay so hang Are we done over here? Okay. We're good. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Um, how much raw water do we have? That's the 74 shares after that 77 with the four shares lost, correct? Uh, we have 70, we currently have 77 shares of North Pier Irrigation Company. And then that is in addition to the lease agreement that we have that secures us. The 2000 acre feet. Correct. Got it. Um, so it's my understanding, this is not more for purchasing more water shares from a specific entity per se, is it's more about diversifying our portfolio. So we possibly have more than one water provider that we could get shares from. Is are, that my which understanding? Line, which line, which that's for about the, the, the water purchase. Um, it would be, uh, al uh, oh, excuse me, allocating uh, dollars for us to pursue uh, raw water purchases or development projects. So just, just to like, excuse me, please, just so we can dumb this way down. Oh, so that money could be used to buy like a CBT share, or let's say somebody decided that they wanted to give up their first right to the call of the Colorado river. Sure. And then we could pursue go that with that Fort fund. Collins. We're on it. Right. <laughs> let's go. Got it. So the, it could be used for yeah. gold, silver, rubies, anything that we could put into that investment portfolio to be converted to drinking water at a later date, but it requires water court conversion. Right. And we chose not to do water court conversion on the 77 shares we have now is there a reason why uh we that decision has not been made um, i haven't made that decision okay explicitly um i can say it would be that would be an interesting and fun experience for our water <laughs> lawyer um and so very expensive that probably wouldn't cover it um but the the reason North Pooter in particular is so valuable is because it has those CBT that CBT water with it that does not require a change of use case, mm -hmm. um, and so there is additional water available with those shares that to utilize that to to turn into potable water we would have to do a change case. Um, Got it. That decision that that would be an avenue that would be looked into and assessed in that water source development plan. Perfect. So there is possibility to explore that further. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and I was just trying to figure it out because when we had had previous discussion, it was kind of explained to us that those seven, 77 shares kind of have no value, but a value to us because they are non-potable and converting that would be an attorney's fun time in court trying to convert those which is why I didn't as a trustee have a massive issue with getting rid of those four shares because it was my understanding that trying to convert them would be very difficult um so I think that how much money do we actually have in our water purchase account as it sits now uh, we believe it's a, it's right at 11 million dollars so we have $11 million already in the water purchase, and we're wanting to allocate another 2.35. This is saying that staff has permission to take 2.3 of that $11 million and use it to pursue water development. It's not saying we're putting more money into it. It's saying they are allowed to take out 2.3 up to $2.3 million without having to come back to the board and say, hey, can we buy water? Um, they have the ability to take out of the $11 million, the 2.3. So it's not adding to that it's taking out of that money that is solely set aside for purchase of water staff can now go and use that money if they find a good deal for water they can now go and purchase that and we've set up the prior board had set up kind of mm -hmm. a and we can get maybe we could send that out to the new board because sure. that was the old board an agreement by which and these amounts the town administrator and town staff was allowed to pursue purchasing water if because sometimes it comes up and they have a couple of days to say hey we want this um, and then inform the board and saying, hey, here's what we move forward with. So got it. Do we have any kind of recommendations, restrictions as trustees to say that while we have 77 shares of raw water, we would like to see this purchase go towards water that was actually potable? Is there any way or anything we have? Well, and I, th I think that what Megan said before about the plan that you guys are talking about developing would be what we need before we start pursuing that really expensive endeavor. 
like before we start talking about pursuing drinkable water, we should talk about what does it cost for us to to treat what we have to convert it into drinkable water. So I think that we need to know what the maximum expansion amount is before we start exploring that. Otherwise we're gonna do it multiple times. If we just wait until we have a little bit more information, I think we'll get the answer out of that study that they're trying to do. Right, so that would be my concern is, is then releasing two point, almost $2.4 million without a study being done to purchase water we might not utilize or might not be as beneficial in this moment as it would be later on. So that's what I'm trying to stress is should the study come before the release of so almost 2.4 million? 2.3 million is not saying on January 1, Megan's gonna go out and buy, spend all 2.3 million. It's saying at any time in the year. So I know the one example of, I think it was last year, the town was approached by someone who was, I think they were retiring a farm or something like that. And they had shares of water and they, I think came to the town first and said, hey, we'd like to give you guys first opportunity to, but we had to let them know within like a couple of days, are we going to pursue this? So if something happens where staff is like, hey, someone's giving us, you know, North Pooter selling at 215 right now, but somebody said, hey, we'll give it to you for 203 a share. And they've got two days to give them a decision. Well, if we're not meeting in the next two days, they can't come back to us and say, hey, we need you to make a budget amendment. And then we, and we can't pursue that. The nice thing with that is because water shares have not been dropping, if we get to a place where we say, hey, we no longer need North Pooter shares, I highly doubt we're going to be in a situation where we're not going to be able to turn around and sell those to purchase some other share. So it's not something where if we buy a North Pooter share, we could not turn around and sell that to purchase some other share down the road. If we, if our study said move this route, what this does is it says, if we have opportunity to purchase some shares of water, which again, that's the only thing we can do with that money is develop water, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we are giving staff the opportunity to say, if you, something comes up, pursue that, but we're not telling them it's only this shares, it's only North Pooter, it's only this, it's just, whatever comes available, they see this is a good fit for where we're going. And that will, I'm sure, change over time as we get the water study done. But I don't think it would be good to say we're not going to purchase any water until the study is done, um, especially if we can get it at a reasonable rate. The other value to that, Trustee Teets, is that when we're diversifying our portfolio, it opens up our opportunity for collaboration with other water providers. Because although we may be restricted on the type of water that we're able to treat. A different water provider may have the legal right and ability to treat and store like CBT, for instance. So as we're looking at these long-term options for water delivery and storage, and we want to create collaborative partnerships with other water providers, by having a more diverse portfolio and taking advantage of these water resources when they become available for purchase, strengthens our position for negotiation and for being a strong collaborative partner in the future. So if just theoretically, 50 years from now, if we decided we wanted, sorry, Bob, if we were going to dig out the bee dams and create our own massive reservoir and partner with Elko, I mean, those, the decisions that we're making and investing and building in our water portfolio today will help in the future. So giving the staff the range to be able to negotiate and uh, diversify our portfolio in a managed and responsible way by allocating these small amounts of money is very responsible for our long-term water portfolio investment. I think what might be a good idea is maybe send out the policy that was approved by the prior board. And then if this board feels that we, because again, we did not approve this policy. That was the past board that approved this policy of purchasing water, like what actually is done with the money once it's budgeted. And if this board feels like, hey, we'd like to have some discussion around maybe changing up that policy a bit, then we can do that. Um, but that would be, I, I think that would be separate from the budget item. That would just be something that we support say, hey, that worked for the old board, but we'd like to see maybe something a little bit different. So I don't know, Patty, could you send that or find that? Yep, you awesome. I had sent a, an email out in general asking her if we could just have a water education and information powwow for our board of trustees. So some of the information from someone who's been sitting for years with my questions, I'm sure Megan or Bob has probably answered them 20 times to different trustees. So just having a chance to sit and have that education and information, I think would be extremely beneficial and might alleviate a lot of questions that probably 
will come up as we move on with water. This is something that occurred to us too. And uh, it was a lot of questions. This is a super hard thing to understand. So maybe once we get past the budget process, we could schedule a work session to kind of get into the nitty gritty on some of that. I think it's good for our residents as well who may have questions. Well, that I think that's very valuable, Trustee Gator, to revisit those negotiation terms. Yep. Okay. Next, Trustee Teets. Anything else? No, that was that's it. Okay. Did we get everybody's questions on the water CIP? Good. All right, did, Trustee Teets. Did Trustee Daly have any questions? Oh, I apologize. Trustee Daly did send me a message when we were um, at recess, and she is not attending the work oh. session. My Sorry, my apologies. I didn't know that, so. Uh, <laughs> so, Trustee Teets, would you kick us off for the uh, comments and questions for the sewer CIP? I can. Sorry, I can't the facility. I don't have the line item because I'm looking at just our packet. Um, so, I want to say it's the C1180, it's the Water Reacclimation Facility Expansion Engineering and Expansion Construction. This is just re-specifying what we have as far as this is funded through our loans. That's what I'm trying to figure out here because that is a good amount of money. Right. This is, uh, if you added up all the existing contracts that the board's approved for this project, they would be spread out between these two GLs design versus construction. Um, and yes, you will see that there's a um, debt service payment associated with this. And of course, we're already submitting for reimbursements on the pay apps that we've gotten to this point. Uh, that's a kind of a laborious process through the state, but um, uh, Dave and Nathan are working hard on that. Got it. So this is not additional. This is what we've already... This is a reflection of everything the board's already seen and, and approved. I about had a heart attack when I saw this two it's, line it's item. Big number. Way <laughs> Perfect. Um, the other question I had was the sewer oversight and reimbursement for Sage Meadows development agreement obligation for oversizing sewer main for both Sage Meadows subdivision and Sage, Me Sage Meadows second subdivision. Did the Town. Trustee Teets, your microphone, please. Okay, sorry. Um, did the town pay for development as far as the oversizing, or is this something that the, the town code and engineering standards allow for the town to oversize an eight inch line, which is what's required of a developer if it is needed for town goals? And oftentimes we do need more than an eight inch line running through the middle of a subdivision. And it is by far the most cost effective way to pay for the bigger pipe, let them pay for the construction, the installation and the value of the eight inch. Uh, so it's by, it is, um, it's just a great deal for the town to get infrastructure that we need built this way. So if there's an opportunity to do that with a developer, then um, with there's some negotiations that we go through with them. They, they uh, a lot of cost estimating and things like that. But in general, if it's something that we have in one of our master plans, for instance, there's a line in the subdivision that needs to be uh, 24 inch instead of an eight inch, we will engage them in the oversizing process. This is a very common program in all municipalities that I've worked in, in the front range, Wyoming. That's all the questions I had. Trustee Wiegand. I really have no questions. Uh, I've built homes before. I know there's a lot of moving parts here and it's way beyond me and you guys know what you're doing. So appreciate it. Thank you. Trustee Mason. No, again, looks great. Appreciate the notes. So. In the spirit of parliamentary procedure and you're next in line, Mr. Nothing further from Karani. myself or the finance committee. Thank you. Trustee Gator. All right. Uh, so I had two questions on this. Uh, number one, vehicle replacement. So it's the same question as the water plant. How many miles on the truck? What shape is it in? Is it unsafe? It's 2002, over 150,000 miles. Um, I'm not even sure that thing's running right now. Okay. So again, we're looking to get three reliable vehicles at each plant. Uh, the second question I had was on uh, line number 23. So that's a viewpoint lift station upgrades. 
Um, so I know you guys mentioned the notes that uh, we are pursuing federal grants on the project, so that's great. Um, the question I have is, does that upgrade need to happen this year, number one? Number two, if we do not get the grants, can we delay the project, which I guess kind of tied into number one, but. Um, we are, we've planned on receiving the grant at a 80-20 uh, split. Okay. Uh, to 20 for our side. So this, this, these are the numbers that we would spend and we're assuming that 80% of that would be reimbursed through the grant. Okay. Uh, if we don't get that grant, we'll, we'll need to rethink this. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's on our list too, is a project that's, um, we know there's things that need to be done. Um, we would like to proceed with the design so that we're, we have a very precise understanding of the cost at that point. So right now this is truly budget level, you know, right. estimating right here. So um, if it needs to move back, I think that that would, you know, there's nothing especially urgent about this project, okay. but uh, that lift station's got some safety issues. It's got an electric junction in the wet well. It's got a lot of things that need to be fixed. Um, and we would also look at over, you know, increasing the capacity of that for expanding the service area to this, to this basin, uh, of this basin to a lift station in accordance with our master plan. Got it. Okay. So, and I appreciate the answers to that. And I think if we get the grant, that does help mm -hmm. out quite a bit. But I think in just looking at um, the amount of expansion that we're doing this year, and there's less next year, but still a lot next year with the plant expansions. Um, and I know most of that was funded through the loans. A portion of that was funded through fund balance. Um, but it just would be nice. I understand it would be great to get a lot of things done, but I'd really truly like to just absolutely limit the things that we are putting out there because again you know we've got to when we put together rates we've got to make sure we factor in 200,000 for that um that if we do do that project so if it's something that could be delayed I think we really need to kind of look at that for this year and next year especially as we're trying to figure out where exactly the financial position is going to be in but thank you I, very much yeah and I would say and I gave you the same answer before if we were going to delay something on this on this CIP would probably be this one Okay, we got a need to for financial management goals. Okay, that would be one. Um, we obviously the board can have for the discussion on that. But if we could, again, I, I guess it does get if we do get the grant, that might change some things. But um, I will say that we should have an, an opportunity to discuss this further when we hear on the grant. One okay. way or the other. Perfect. That would be great. Those are the only questions I had. Okay. Any final comment from the board? No, thank you. Thank you, staff, for all of your hard work on the budget and budget development so far. With that, I think meeting adjourned. Trustee Wiegand. No, I just wanted to thank you, too. Great work. Thanks, both Okay. I also just wanted to say thank you for going through the process. I know there's been a lot of questions of, is this just a waste of time? This really isn't. This is how government's supposed to work. You know, staff and the board sit down and go through this. You know, when we're approving a budget that's tens of millions of dollars, it's good for us to understand that and to be able to ask our questions directly to the staff for them to be able to answer those. And I think it's also very good that this is happening in a public forum so that members of the public who care about where their money's going can actually hear it straight from the source, which is the town versus some random person that may or may not know what they're talking about. So I appreciate the process. This has been the cleanest budget I've gone through yet and uh, appreciate all the work that the staff has put into this. So thank you. So that's something to say is, you know, on the feedback that I do get, a lot of the questions have come from Last call, final comment. Anybody else? Okay, adjourned. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. <laughs>